All right. Hi, I'm Jeff Klon. I um I am an investigator in an act and I lead a data quality group um, that is developing some interesting tools to study the data quality and act. And as you can see, of course, with this concierge medicine, you need quality data in order to accurately answer the questions that you're asking. Um, and we know some things about an act data already. It's already harmonized to a standard ontology um, because you can query across the network. So we know that the data is all mapped to standard things and the codes that you're querying are all the same codes across the network. But there's still a lot of room for subtle quality problems and that's the kind of things that we're working on. So the project that I'm gonna be talking about in the next 10 or 15 minutes is, uh, well, well, it's called a number of different things, but today I will call it patient counting analytics and visualization pipeline. So over the years of an ACT and ACT and other data networks before it, we've come up with a list of questions that we think are apropos for answering, even when you have data harmonized to a standard ontology. And um, one is simply about sites compared to other sites. How, how does my site compare to the network average sites? Do I have 4% um, of my patients have diabetes, but on average, 25% of site patients have diabetes. Well, that could be something wrong with my data. It could be something different about my patient population, um, but it is something that does warrant some investigation. Uh, there's a question of what is missing. There are hundreds of thousands of possible data elements in an act. And um, so many sites are missing you know, codes that they don't use. There are different ways of coding uh, labs, link codes vary slightly from site to site. And so that missingness is not particularly important, but what if a broad swath of labs are missing and, or there are, there are no procedure data, that, then that is some missingness that might be important and worth flagging. Um, and then uh, trends across refreshes. So the, the enact sites, uh, it's not real-time data from the AHR. The sites refresh their data um, every month or less or more. And when you refresh that data, there's always room for errors to be introduced. Maybe uh, your source data pipeline changed and your process to extract the data no longer works quite, quite right. And perhaps all of your, um, you know, again, all of your procedure data disappeared. That did actually happen, not in an act, but in another data network that I was in. Uh, just an entire domain of data disappeared. Uh, so that's another important thing that's uh, worth flagging. And then code variations uh, between between sites. How are, you know, how are labs coded specifically? Um, and you can actually figure out a lot of this just by running queries in the network. So this example, there's a query running in the network for diagnosing diseases of the circulatory system. So by just running this query and getting back counts from the sites, you can look at the variation across sites and the site averages and whether or not you're an outlier. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, people in, in ACT, Michelle Morris have piloted work that does this where you run these swaths of data quality queries on a regular basis and you aggregate the results into a spreadsheet and produce reports. Um, but what I'm gonna talk about is something a little bit higher scale and a little more automatic. So like I said, there are, there are hundreds of thousands of data elements in the, in the Shrine and ACT ontology. And what if you just counted the number of patients with every single one of those things? So every patient with infectious parasitic diseases, every patient with neoplasms. And then you could do all of these things you can do with counts at a massive scale. But that's over 600,000 counts up to if you have all the data elements at any individual site. Um, so over the years and uh, many people's contribution, like Griffin Weber, Darren Henderson, myself, uh, several other people, Mike Mendez, that pe people have developed these tools to uh, count um, all of the elements in the database, the number of patients with each of these thing, things at a very rapid pace. And now we can count uh, the MGB data set of 4 million patients um, and all of these elements, we can count the number of patients with these things in a few hours. 
And this is this is a slide that I put in to challenge myself to explain how this counting works. And I'm just going to go over it very quickly and you can ask questions about this later. But we can do this with something called the transitive closure, which lists all of the ancestors of a particular node uh, and all of the descendants. So um, everything under nervous system diseases will have a row in this table, um, including you know, specific codes like Bell's palsy, G51.0, and um, all of the more general terms above that as well. And then, um, and then you have the data with, with the actual codes. It's simply a join of these two tables. So you do a, you do a join in SQL, you get, um, you get the counts of all of the things that the individual rows with the descendants. And you, because you have the ancestors repeated, you get counts of the ancestors as well. So you can, um, through almost a trivial amount of SQL with these data structures in place, you can count the the number of patients with all of these things. So taking advantage of that, we've built this uh, data quality pipeline. So we distribute this uh, stored procedure that does this. Uh, it's part of I2B2 now, but you can also download it separately. And sites run the stored procedure and then um, the results are obfuscated and blurred, meaning patients that are patient counts that are under 10 are removed and uh, patient counts themselves are rounded to something close to the nearest 10. And this allows some anonymization of uh, the data. So it's harder to re-identify and you can't um, look at small counts and figure out, um, you know, like, oh, there was one patient with this disease. And I happen to know from the news that this disease and this, pa and this hospital were mentioned. So I can figure out who the patient was. So by doing these things, we can avoid all of that. Uh, then people can contribute, people being the site administrators, can contribute their accounts to the uh, secure SFTP repository hosted by uh, the Enact group. And we can aggregate all of that and uh, smush it together into uh, site statistics. So we can count, we can create a file that shows the number of sites with each of these things, the average number of patients with each of these things, and the standard deviation. Um, and then we can feed that network statistics file along with the uh, local file that the site has generated into web tools that we are making available to the Enact network. And uh, I'm going to show a, a brief video and try to explain this very cool data quality tool that was written by Dave Wang sitting over there, but I'll try to do him justice in terms of playing this. So. I could try I could try this and see if it works. Nope. Pause. I'm gonna to try to pause and unpause it and we'll see. Let's see if this works. So this is the tool. When you open it up, you load your local data file. This is all synthetic data. And it uh, loads uh, loads all your data and you can choose which domain or which ontology tree you're interested in. And then it shows you this ontology tree as a set of circles and lines. And um, and then when you click on one of these things, you get this very informative little graphic that here is showing on the on the left and on the right or toward the center, I suppose. It shows the uh, this is all COVID nineteen related firms. So this is not COVID positive tests. This is anything related to COVID, including pneumonia. So there are a lot of patients that have facts that are in this portion of the tree. So you can see the average percent is about 80% 80, 80 with a standard deviation, quite a large standard deviation. You can also uh, see another important one is toward the bottom of that window is the total number of sites that have contributed. So 12 out of 13 sites contributed account to that and you get a box plot as well. So this, this is a very, very useful tool. I think partly for exploring data quality issues Partly just for understanding what data is in the network. Okay, that's not what I wanted. Ah, okay. So we can look for outliers. So the color code of the little dots tells you whether they're outliers and the outline tells you if the children have outliers 
and the um, and the color of the dot tells you if it is an outlier. So here we've clicked on uh, supplemental oxygen variation, which is a, a lower, I believe it's a lower percentage of patients that your site where we loaded our local data has that has supplemental oxygen than the average site. And in a, a maybe statistically significant way in that it's uh, multiple standard deviations above or below the average. And uh, keep going. We can continue to expand terms. We have this cool uh, sum tree visualization that um, that highlights just the number of nodes in the tree that are uh, the deviate from the mean. And so as you can see, like right below other variables of interest, there are two out of 13 nodes that deviate. Um, and then as you go deeper into the tree, at the end, it's 10 out of 59 and then zero out of six. So this is a, a, a way to see what's happening in the tree at a, a very a summary level. And then when you click on these individual sections, it shows the pathway down the tree that leads you there and the outliers that are in that yellow snippet of the box that appear in the sum tree view. Now I'm gonna show a, a table view, which allows you to slice and dice your data, or more slice than dice, I suppose, but um, you, can, you can set filter, uh, you can set filters on your data. So we can choose only, um, there we go. Yeah, we can choose only nodes that have the code E13 in them. And then by clicking less than the minimum, um, it will only show uh, nodes where your local data is less than the site statistics that have been submitted to the network. And so, so through that mechanism, you can, um, and then you can open up to where in the tree that uh, that outlier is. So through that mechanism, you can zoom in on quality problems. And um, a piece that we're we're working, we're starting to think through next is, uh, you know, there's this um, table tool that lets you kind of interactively find your quality problems, but uh, we want to start adding hints, kind of maybe a wizard of sorts to point you to perhaps your biggest quality problems. Um, okay, uh, just I put this slide in because this shows like a real example of uh, in a data outlier issue that is not actually a quality problem, but does highlight a real difference in the data. So this is a site in a place where it's sunnier than it is here usually, and they have a higher than average uh, percentage of patients with skin cancer. Um, so we have we did a pilot last summer where we collected data from sites. And so we have uh, 16 participating sites right now. Um, now, Enact has over 40 sites, so this was a smallish pilot. So we are, um, as soon as I send out the email, uh, which we'll do after this conference, we will uh, kick off another call to ARMS to uh, collect new data. We're going to try to collect data from as many sites in an act as possible so we can get a real picture of the whole network. Um, and, and we have uh, just made available this data quality tool for investigators that are interested in taking a look at it. Um, and you can find that on the Enact website. Um, you have to apply for an account, but anyone in the Enact network can apply for an account. Um, the, let's see, I've been talking a while, the other time, yeah, a minute, a minute or two. So this is, this is some work that, uh, that was done uh, a few months ago, and we haven't turned this into a public tool yet, but th this shows some ideas of other things that we plan to do with data quality. So this is showing um, the trends across refreshes. So these are simply the overall number of facts in the data as you, uh, as sites refresh their data. So you'd expect as you refresh your data, that there would be more data than before or the same amount perhaps, but not less. And that's pretty much what's happening here. So we're not seeing any obvious quality problems there. 
here we're highlighting just the number of domains that are populated at different sites. So you can see that, for example, site C doesn't have any ICD-10 procedures. So uh, I actually asked that site, um, do you have ICD-10 procedures in your data? And they don't actually put that in their ITB2. So that not a quality error, but something that you know was flagged that was worth discussing with that site. Um, and then other views of outliers and averages we're also exploring. Um, so we are in the process of collecting new accounts, rolling this out to sites, and then adding additional wizard-like features. And um, there's some links. I think the slides will go out and you can click on those. So again, thank you to the big group that has worked on this. And I will sit down. I think we're going to take questions. We have a, uh, a few minutes for questions, if there are any. I do have a microphone set up in the middle of the room. Um, just do you, you can turn that on if you'd like, or I can come running at you with a microphone. Your choice. So questions for Jeff or Sean. Um, very interesting talk, actually. Um, I have a question for Sham. So the case study for hydroquinone with COVID was very interesting. Just curious uh, if something could be done for long COVID also, because there is a lot of implication and emphasis for long COVID. So, uh, so you see a question about other diseases beyond COVID or... Oh yeah, so uh, in act, um, really we don't have a restriction of uh, on any disease or any conditions. So as long as you can come up with clever ways to query the data, you can run any kind of queries on it. I mean, we just picked this COVID one up because um, it it's a clever way to get to that hydro uh, the HCQ answer by taking advantage of the fact that it's used for other reasons. And so you're kind of just looking at this natural experiment which is happening uh, during the pandemic because we know that uh, rheumatoid arthritis, if you are prescribed hydroxychloroquine, they're taking it long term. And so if you expect hydroxychloroquine to be protective of COVID, you would see it in these patients. And so that's why we kind of uh, went with that question and also, the person who came up with the clever one is uh, is an expert in rheumatoid arthritis. But um, so part of what this tells us is that you kind of need this combination of clinical expertise, the informatics expertise in terms of what kind of data is available out there. Uh, and of course, the statistical study design to be able to design a study um, in this way. And this is something that we are looking at, uh, the clinical and translational researchers increasingly want to do these kind of uh, studies. But what it's, uh, what's challenging about this is that uh, it sort of turns the natural study design on its head. The natural way most of clinical and translational um, research works is that you come up with a hypothesis and followed by a study design after which the data is collected. Here the data is pre-collected and you have to work with what you already have. And so um, you have to be somewhat clever in coming up with ways to query it or, or at least uh, very quickly show that you probably can't answer this uh, particular question. But yeah, beyond COVID, we can do almost anything else. Any, any uh, condition which for which structured data is available, you can do. Uh, some limitations are things like um, rare diseases. Rare diseases are not well coded by ICD codes, for example. So you can't really investigate rare diseases with this kind of data. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as of last week, University of Missouri is on board with NACT, and I'm excited. 
to be we are excited to be part of the network. Um, my question related to the advanced analytical queries and the possibility uh, through Enact or the Shrine framework that uh, what do you think the future looks like in terms of or what we could try as a network partner to implement as a framework that we could deploy uh, advanced analytical queries um, through the framework that you build. If you could um, discuss some of those aspects would be helpful. Sure, uh, th that's a great question. So uh, I think what we have learned through these federated networks uh, is that there are sort of three ways you can query the network. The first one, which only Enact enables you to do compared to other networks is uh, interactively query it. But what you get is just counts back, which is the shrine way of doing. And you can use it for certain you know, kinds of questions like this clinical uh, questions. The other extreme is the enclave, um, which is you push all the data, gather it at a central place, and then you can pretty much do any kind of analytics you can think of. You can do advanced machine learning, you can do simple statistical methods. Um, and that also uh, with the enclave project, we'll be enabling it. Now there is an intermediate way of doing uh, analytics that is distributed analytics where instead of pushing the data to a central place, you're pushing code, uh, which uh, was uh, done quite a bit, which is actually the, the 4C network functioned that way. Code is written in one place, and then it's sent over to the participating sites. They run it against the database, and uh, um, the output of the analytic, analytics is then sent over to central place, which puts it all together. And the main advantage of doing it that way is that you don't have to change the IRB because IRB allows you to push counts out. While for the Enclave project, you know, we still have to do a lot of this IRB and the governance to be able to share uh, data effectively. And in fact, the data quality project is essentially using this third way of functioning, which is there is code which is running and counting everything locally. And then that is uh, sent over to the central place to be able to um, put it all together. The one piece which some of the advanced machine learning people want, which currently we cannot really do with NAC, is to be able to do federated learning of machine learning. So federated learning and machine learning means iteratively you need to be able to go back. So things like neural network learning, where you have to keep updating these parameters, um, you need code which goes automatically against the federated network uh, gets the first set of coefficients and then updates it and so on and so forth. So right now in Enact, you can interactively interact with all the nodes only in a manual fashion. So this query is all constructed by hand. And so that is something we're thinking about um, in terms of can we automate uh, querying through the Shrine interface. So even for these things like the clinical um, concierge kind of questions, it would be useful to be able to automate uh, because typically it involves running four queries or eight queries. Um, and it would be nice you know, if they can be packaged and then let the queries run across the network instead of constructing this uh, one by one and uh, running it, even though the technology now allows us to run them in parallel. So that is something which uh, we haven't explicitly thought about, but it would be something interesting to do. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Jeff or Sean? Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yep. Appreciate it.